to account what's going to happen in the future, and then based on that, I need to pick an appropriate action right now. Uh, so in order to do that, we studied two essential theories. One was a maximum principle-based uh, method, which gave me optimal open loop control. Um, in that particular uh, problem, or in that particular methodology, the co-state vector P underscore T, that used to take into account the future cost or that basically encodes information about the sensitivity of your current action on the future cost, okay? Um, in the case of dynamic programming, which gives you a closed loop control, the value function encodes information about how much it's going to cost, how much the current action is going to cost you in the future, okay? So, uh, so in those two uh, theories, or those two methodologies, of course, they are different in a sense that in one case you get open loop control, in the other case you get closed loop control. Um, the essential feature was you have some variable in the optimization routine which stores information about the effect of current action into the future cost. Now, now there are many cases where you have uh, stochasticity in your decision variable. So you want to decide something, but you don't know about, um, about what's going to happen in the future. And so you somehow have to make the decision under some sort of ambiguity about the future or under some sort of risk about the future. Okay, and so we, we, study, all, we study this class of problems under the umbrella of stochastic optimization where whatever we don't know about the future, we just consider it as a random variable we assign some probability distribution to that random variable, and then we try to optimize some expected function or whatever. So we'll talk about what kind of optimization problems you can formulate. So in order to study stochastic optimization, we need to understand probability. Now, I don't assume that all of you are familiar with probability. Of course, it's part of undergraduate curriculum in some of the departments, uh, but uh, but in order to get everyone on board, I'm going to start with some, in, some brief introduction to probability. It's not going to be difficult to pick up probability. Um, and then we will talk about stochastic optimization. Uh, to start with the motivation, uh, I want to consider a couple of examples of stochastic optimization. So the first example is, before the semester starts, you want to take classes, right? You want to enroll in classes. But you don't know which class is going to be difficult and which class is going to be easy, right? So, so what do you do? So how do you decide which class you should take? If you don't know which is going to be difficult, which is going to be easy, what do you do? Can someone tell me? How did you pick up this? How did you pick, how did you choose this class? Yeah, okay. Look at the description and think, oh, that's interesting. Try to ask as many people as I know if they take the class. Okay, so there. So you look at the description of the class and then you make a decision whether you want to take that class or not based on your own interest. Okay, but that doesn't really tell you whether you will do well in that class or whether you will not do well in that class, right? So that still remains a random variable. Of course, you want to take classes in which you're going to do well because that's going to affect your grade and subsequently all the employers are going to look at your grades and stuff. So yeah. Yeah, occasionally I'll look at, at rate my professor. Okay. <laughs> then you shouldn't have taken this class. <laughs> okay. Okay. So he, he looks at rate my professor. So he conducts a survey in order to figure out, in order to get some information about what's he, what he is going to see in the future. Okay. And then based on that, he will take the class. So there is some randomness about enrolling in a class and uh, one of the suggestions that Matthew has is you look at some external sources of information to understand or to some sort of evaluate the randomness, okay? The amount of randomness in, in your decision making, so in the decision process. So, so that's one way of doing uh, stochastic optimization, which is if you have a random variable that you don't know anything about, you essentially try to extract information from other sources in order to reduce the variability in the randomness, okay? Um, so that's one way of doing stochastic optimization. Uh, let's look at another problem where you cannot do anything like that. 
So this is known as a news vendor problem. So the idea is, uh, in the morning, you have to pick up newspapers from a newspaper company, and then you stand at a train station or a bus station or wherever, right? And you sell newspapers. And the customers are going to come. They may decide to buy a newspaper. They may not decide to buy a newspaper, right? So there's some randomness. And you, don't, you can't really go and ask around, OK, who's going to buy the newspaper tomorrow from me, and then decide how many newspapers you, can, you need to buy in the morning. Right? So you buy, let's say, 100 newspapers. And by evening, sometimes 90 newspapers are sold. Sometimes only 10 newspapers are sold. Sometimes all the 100 newspapers are sold. In fact, more people are coming to buy newspapers, but you have to ask those customers to return because you don't have enough newspapers in your inventory. Right? So, so in that kind of stochastic optimization, um, there is really a true randomness that you cannot really figure out. Um, you cannot really get information about that ram randomness beforehand. So over the Thanksgiving break, many people went and bought stuff from the uh, from the stores around the area, right? So I bought this cap. I wanted to buy two of these caps, but there was only one available in the inventory, so I had to go back and order another cap um, online, right? So there was some. Uh, but so so the thing is, um, even even. Companies have to decide how much inventory of each items to keep based on the randomness about how many customers are going to come and pick whatever they want. And, and then, of course, your inventory will decrease by that amount. Um, and the issue is, if a customer returns because the inventory was not adequate, then you have a loss, then you incur a loss, right? Because the customer came to your door and you couldn't serve the demand. So there is some loss associated with it, and you, of course, want to minimize such losses in your everyday operations. So uh, is the newspaper problem seems to be different than the other uh, uh, ways you're describing the problem. Because if I have hats, uh, it's, it might not be as cold tomorrow, but people are still going to want hats. Uh, it's, if I have newspapers, it's, it's a fixed time frame. Um, uh, in property. If I have it tomorrow, people are going to want tomorrow's newspaper, not the one from yesterday. So uh, are we looking at, at things that only have value over yes. a specific time Yes, frame? yes. Okay. So that's a very important aspect of the news vendor problem, because the items that you are trying to sell in the news vendor problem are perishable items. So after a certain time, the item has no value. OK, so what are perishable items? Well, food items are perishable because they have an expiry date. Uh, medicines are perishable because they also have an expiry date. Uh, newspapers are perishable because by the end of the day, the, uh, the news is not new anymore, and therefore it loses the value. The newspaper loses its value by the end of the day. So these are items where there is a high value at the beginning, and then suddenly the value drops to zero. Okay, so, uh, so news vendor problem has this ability to model situations where you have a perishable item and you want to sell or you want to create an inventory, or you want to understand how much, how much of these perishable items you need to have in your inventory so that you can sell it, and you will not make too much loss if uh, you have to throw it away in the end of the day, or you have to return it, or you have to recycle it, or you have to do whatever else you need to do uh, with the items. Okay? So for food items, it is usually thrown away. Uh, for newspapers, it is sent to a recycle station where all the paper gets recycled. Uh, so, of course, there is some cost associated with all that. So, we'll study that formulation today. Okay, so those are the reasons why we need to study stochastic optimization. And it's a very important, a very broad field, and it has become extremely useful nowadays because of all this, uh, all this noise about machine learning. Because you do a lot of uh, stochastic optimization um, to, within, within the whole area of machine learning. Okay, so let's have a brief introduction to probability. So within probability, we have, we need to define a few things. We have omega, the set of all uncertainty. Or uncertainties. You have A, which is a subset of omega. This is uh, an event. You have P, 
which maps 2 raised to omega to 0, 1, which is called the probability probability function. Okay. So, 2 raised to omega is the power set of omega. Yes. So, this is just Kolmogorov the axiomatic theory. Yeah. When yeah, but I'm not, in, I'm not introducing it in full generality because that requires measure theory. Yep. Um, so, 2 raised to omega is power set of omega. Then x as a function from omega to r is known as random variable. And then y as a function from omega to rn is known as random vector. Okay, so you have a fair die. So it has, it looks like a cube with dots all over the place, right? So there the omega is 1, 2, 6, and then an event A would be, let's say, 1, 2. And then the probability of A appearing would be 1 over 6 plus 1 over 6 equals to 1 over 3. Okay, so this is the discrete random variable. So not random variable, but this is a uh, the omega, the set of all uncertainty is discrete. So it has only six uh, variables, and or rather six events. And then A is a uh, sum of two events, so one and two. And so the way you get the probability of event A is by adding the probability of one appearing and the probability of two appearing. So this is actually probability of 1 plus probability of 2. Okay, So each of this would appear with a probability of 1 over 6, which is uh, what a fair die means. So the probability that one of the face would appear on top is just 1 over 6, because there are 6 faces. Okay, So that's how you compute the probability of an event in the case of a fair die. Okay. You could also have a uniform distribution. So there omega is 0, 1. You could define uniform distribution over any bounded interval. So I'm just using 0, 1 as a proxy. Um, so omega is between 0 and 1. Any event A would be a subset of omega. So let's say A equals to a comma b, 0 less than equal to a less than equal to b less than equal to 1. Okay, just an interval between 0 and 1. And I'm going to define the probability of a as integral a to b dx, which is just b minus a. And this is less than equal to 1, of course. Actually, I don't want to write x. I'll write omega because I've used x as a random variable. So omega. So here, what we say is that the probability distribution has a density function. Let me call this g of omega, which is equal to 1 if omega is in 0, 1, 
and 0 otherwise. Okay, these are just the terminologies in, in probability theory. Okay, any questions so far? So how many of you have taken probability before? Have you seen this stuff before? How many of you have not seen this stuff before? Okay, that's good because everybody is just recapping probability then. Okay. So in this case, we have a density function. There is another uh, nice probability distribution function which is known as Gaussian random variable. So your omega is r. Your g of omega is given by 1 over square root of 2 pi sigma uh, exponential of minus omega, omega minus mu square over 2 sigma square. And this is known as Gaussian distribution. So n denotes normal distribution with mean mu and variance sigma square. Okay, and you can find the probability of an event by just substituting uh, that g of omega right here. So probability of a is integral over a of g omega d omega. Sorry. Okay. So there are two important uh, uh, terminologies that I need to introduce now if you, if you have understood everything so far. So one is the cumulative distribution function and the other one is expected value. cumulative distribution function. So I use f of a to denote cumulative distribution function which is the probability that x of omega is less than or equal to a which is minus infinity to a g of omega d of omega. Okay, so f is known as CDF, cumulative distribution function. Okay, the next thing is expected value. So we denote it by expected, so E of x, which is integral of x of omega, uh, g of omega, d omega, and this is over the entire set omega. Okay, so I'm writing integral more generally. If you have a discrete uh, set of uncertainty, then you just have to replace the integral with summation. Okay, that's it. Any questions so far? Okay. 
Okay. Now that we have understood these basic definitions in probability, uh, let's look at the stochastic, some basic formulations in stochastic optimization. So I have a function f from some set x cross omega to r, okay? And I want to find, so x is the set of all decisions, omega is the set of all uncertainty, um, and r is of course the cost associated with a specific decision and a specific uncertainty. Uh, variable. So for instance, in the case of news vendor problem, X is how many newspapers you need to buy in the morning. Omega is how many customers would arrive. And R is the total cost associated with serving those customers. So there is a cost of acquiring newspaper, then there is a revenue generated through selling those newspapers, and then there is some amount of leftover newspaper in the evening, which you need to discard, and then there is some cost or reward associated with uh, recycling those newspapers. Okay, so you aggregate all of that together in order to get this objective function f. So there are three essential formulations that you can have when you are dealing with stochastic optimization. Um, these formulations are not useful in static optimization because there is no uncertainty, but now that there is uncertainty in the optimization problem, it adds a lot of richness to the amount of things you can do with the optimization. So let's see what those uh, what those uh, formulations are. So the first is risk neutral optimization. In the risk neutral optimization, I want to solve the following problem. I want to minimize the expected value of f x comma omega, where x is in the set capital X. Okay, this is same as saying I want to minimize over x and x integral over all omega, f of x omega, g of omega, d of omega. Okay. So in the case of static optimization, uh, we didn't have to evaluate any integral. It was just minimize the function with respect to x. Why is it called risk neutral? Any thoughts? Yes. Because we're just operating off of of what the expected value is, yes. we're, we're not talking about how uh, the outcome being, being we win the lottery right. the, or we right. make no money, it's just the average right. between them. Right, it's just the average, okay? So you're just taking the average of all possible costs. How do you take the average? Well, you weigh it with the probability distribution, so you take the average of all the costs uh, and averaging with respect to the distribution over the underlying random variable and then you just want to minimize. You want to pick 
and x, you want to pick a decision variable x that minimizes this average expected cost. Okay. You could also have risk sensitive optimization. where the goal is to minimize, I mean, you could have multiple ways of formulating risk sensitivity, but I'm just going to write two ways. I want to minimize the expected value of E raised to F X omega, which is the same as minimizing integral over all omega E raised to F x omega, g omega, d omega. Okay, is that clear? So what are we doing here? We have a specific loss function, f. I'm going to increase the magnitude of x if the cost is very high, but if the cost is low, I don't really care, okay? So I'm going to penalize high costs a lot and then weigh my objective function according to that high loss, uh, according to that distorted loss function and then I'll pick, pick a decision X, which is risk sensitive, okay? So in the risk sensitive case, you are picking a decision variable that's going to give you a decent return under all possible uncertainties that you could see. Isn't it more likely that that approach, if you're the uh, newspaper, their uh, seller would tell you to find no newspapers? Sorry, is the seller? It, it would tell you, to do nothing uh, unless you specifically tailored or X, X to require some action. So let me give you another example. It's not necessarily useful in the news vendors problem, even though you can probably think about it in that way. Um, electricity, okay, electricity is an essential commodity in today's world. Uh, we cannot live without, we cannot function without electricity. A lot of things will shut down if there was no electricity. In fact, I'll recount from my experience, I was, in, uh, uh, I was in Palo Alto once, and because of some reason, actually because of some sort of cyber attack, the electricity grid went down, went down in that area, okay? Or some, some, maybe some other reason. I, I thought it was cyber attack because I saw it in the news, but nowadays some news are fake, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, uh, so I went to a coffee shop, I just wanted to work. I went to a coffee shop and I asked them for coffee and they said they cannot give me coffee because there's no electricity. Uh, so there is no electricity, so they cannot bill me, they cannot give me a receipt, they cannot run credit card, whatever uh, things. And they could not make coffee for me, okay? So they really, so, and you can multiply that to all the businesses in that area and think about how much loss there was, merely because there was some fault somewhere in the electricity grid. So, so in those cases, they basically formulate it as a risk sensitive optimization, okay? May not be exactly this formulation, but one of the various formulations of risk sensitive optimization. And the way they solve this problem or the way the, uh, the outcome of the optimization comes out to be the following. There are many generators that are running at their lowest capacity at all times, okay? Many generators. And the reason for that is if one of the generator has a fault and it shuts down immediately, then all these generators will quickly ramp up their electricity production in order to meet the demand. Okay, so even though you may have an outage, the outage will only last five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, until all these generators that are running at their lowest capacity ramp up their production to meet the current demand. Okay, um, how does OSU solve this problem? So you know there is a Macrican power plant right next to the RPAC. 
So if there is some fault somewhere which basically prevents electricity from getting delivered at OSU, then that power plant will go up to full capacity and will power all the essential services within OSU. So essential services would be some sort of computing systems and medical center and all these other places that really require power. It wouldn't power these classrooms because these are not uh, essential. I mean, okay, they are essential, but, <laughs> but not as critical as hospitals or, or computing servers, which are crunching a lot of data at all the time. So, so, you know, that's what the outcome of these risk sensitive optimization is that even though the probability of some generator failing or some transmitter burning up is extremely low, uh, you still keep the power plant up and running and incur all the cost of running the power plant for the entire year um, because at some point of time some failures might happen and it always happens somewhere. Uh, so you kind of know that the failures will happen eventually. So some failure will happen somewhere and we don't want to risk the lives of the people in the hospital or uh, risk uh, not running some of these uh, very intensive uh, uh, simulations that you know we run at universities uh, because there is no power okay so you lose all that time and resources so you do, you don't want to incur those losses and that's why you keep running uh, these generators all the time and incur the cost so that's what the outcome of risk sensitive optimization would be there's another uh, formulation for risk sensitivity so i want to minimize the expected value of the function such that the probability that h of x comma omega is greater than or equal to zero is less than or equal to delta. Okay, so in this case, the goal is I want to minimize certain cost, but it is acceptable to have situations where some constraints are, uh, are so we don't want, so, so this delta is a small number. So with small probability, I'm okay if this constraint is not satisfied or if this constraint is satisfied, okay? So normally we would want to operate under this condition, but it's okay to not have that condition met as long as the probability of that entire event is very, very small. So let me give you a concrete example. You are Kroger, okay? And you have a lot of food coming into your facility, and you want to minimize the cost of refrigeration, okay? Refrigeration consumes a lot of energy. So you want to minimize the cost of refrigeration as long as the probability that the temperature of the food is going to be above certain limit is very, very small, okay? So this allows you to probably keep the food outside for some time and then again put it back in the refrigeration system. So this would normally happen if you are transporting food from point A to point B. It has to sit somewhere in order for it to be transported back into some other warehouse. Okay, so those are the situations where you would use this kind of risk sensitivity. Because, so if, if you did not formulate it as a risk sensitive optimization, you might lose your entire supply because it, kept, it was kept outside for a very long time. Okay, so, so you don't want to, you want to avoid those events from happening. Okay, so that's, risk, that's taking into account the risks associated with your decision variable X in this case. How easy are these methods to uh, tune X to exclude uh, um, like points of extreme concern, or um, like uh, um, with the so generally these problems are very hard to solve. Okay. But nonetheless, people have looked at these problems for some specific applications and have figured out some heuristic or some specific methods to solve these problems. So, for instance, this is a non-convex constraint, mm -hmm. right? But you there is a way to convex convexify this constraint set um, in a manner that you get a meaningful result, 
Okay, so you get some. So with, with these problem structures as opposed to uh, of a newspaper problem, the way I'm seeing it is the newspaper problem, if you're the guy on the street corner, the only one uh, who cares if you make a mistake is you. Mm -hmm. you know, but when you're dealing with the real world electricity market or when you're Kroger, you're going to have uh, external regulatory controls on what's allowable at right. all. Right. Uh, and how tunable are these methods to adjust to the things that we say are not allowable under any circumstances. So, you know, the government would probably specify this, when would this probability, sh how much should this probability be, mm -hmm. right? And once the government specifies that all the companies are going to solve this risk sensitive optimization to make sure that they are under, I mean, they, they, their risks are under control, okay, so spe as specified by the government. You, you handle it by saying, what's yes. my allowance yes. downtime? Yes. Okay. Now, if you are a mutual funds company like Fidelity or whatever, right, and you're managing retirement funds of many, many millions of people, you want to you want to give them portfolio which maximizes their overall return over long period of time. So X would be how many stocks of each category should you have in your portfolio, subject to the probability that by the time you retire, you, it shouldn't be like, no matter how the market is behaving, you should still have a certain amount of money in your retirement account, right? So with very high probability. So those are the situations where people study risk sensitive formulations. If you don't have money in your retirement account towards the end of your, I mean, when you are planning to retire, for whatever reason, the market could be down or whatever, right? It's an extremely bad outcome. So you want to avoid those outcomes. And so you are risk sensitive about how much money your portfolio, I mean, what your portfolio should be so that you don't lose a lot of money if you get closer to your uh, retirement. Is that sort of a dynamic problem? It is a dynamic problem. So the, the allocation would change over a period of time. Right. Okay, so you put more bonds and less of stocks as you grow older. The probability changes over time. Yes, yes, yes. So within this, uh, within this stochastic optimization, I'm talking about mostly static optimization, but you can of course have dynamic formulations as well. The third optimization, which is my favorite, is regret minimization. Okay, so in the risk neutral, I took a weighted average of my loss function and I minimized it. In the risk sensitive, I distorted the loss function and then I minimized it. In the regret, I want to minimize my regret, okay? So how do you define regret? What would be a, a reasonable definition of regret in your opinion? So any thoughts? What is regret? Yes. Observing that a more positive outcome was possible, mm -hmm. um, despite the fact that you made the decision that you made. Okay. So if I if I went into a situation and felt what I felt at the time that I did the best right. I could, then it turned out that I could have done better. Right. Well, then that difference is my right. regret. Right. Right. That difference is your regret. That's right. Okay. So mathematically, you would define the regret at x, which is your decision variable, and omega, which is the uncertainty that you could not observe, the regret will be defined as f of x comma omega minus min over all y in x, f of x comma, f of y comma omega. So in other words, this is f of x comma omega minus f of y star omega comma omega, which is always greater than or equal to zero. Okay. That's the definition of regret. So what is uh, this definition? So X is what I, the decision that I took. Omega is the actual uncertainty that was realized, that would be realized in the future. If I had known omega, I would have essentially taken Y star as my decision, okay? So what is Y star? It's minimum of Y over X, F of Y comma omega, so that's, uh, so Y star is argmin of this particular 
uh, optimization routine. Okay, and it depends on omega. So if omega was this, I would have taken this decision. If omega was that, I would have taken that decision. And that's my optimal function. So optimal, optimal cost if I had known omega in advance, and this is the decision I would have taken. So this, the difference between the two is actually the regret. Okay, yes. So that, by definition, is an aggressive strategy, correct? It's a? An aggressive strategy. A no, I wouldn't call it an aggressive strategy. No. Why would you call it an aggressive strategy? Because, as, uh, like, if you have a poker game, right? Game, you're attempting to uh, minimize the regret. Where, if in the future, you learn if you could have gone all in at one opportunity and then won everything, and because of it, you would be more inclined to take the all-in opportunity than under. Yeah, but the then you also might lose a lot of money. Okay. Right. So if you, if if that didn't happen. If omega was something else, then you would lose a lot of money. So you have to have a balance between how much regret you will accumulate in every situation. Okay. Okay, and then of course you have to weigh it according to your own preferences. Yeah. So given that we don't know, we know the possible space of values. Right. But for any given realization, we don't know what omega is going to be. That's right. So how could we ever calculate what y star is? Do we just try to do it on the average? Like or what? So for every possible omega, you have this function that tells you how much your loss is. So we actually calculate that yeah. theory for every Yeah, for every possible value of omega. Okay. Um, so to, to go back to the which class should I take problem, uh, omega was how much difficult that class is going to be. If you had known earlier, you would have basically taken that class or not taken that class. But since you did not know earlier how the class is going to be for you, you have taken certain action, and this is the total regret that you accumulated. Okay? So the, my hope is that you're not regretting taking this class, okay? <laughs> which means that your regret is close to zero. Uh, um, but I, I cannot assure that, right? Uh, but what Matthew did was looked at ratemyprofessors.com in order to get some information about omega and make an informed decision at the very beginning. So then the actually forming a decision rule there requires that we can characterize Omega's entire yes. distribution function. Yes. If we can't do that, then we'll just end up with a bunch of different decisions. That's right. No That's right. Yeah. Control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a problem. I mean, of course, this is all theoretical in the sense that you need to specify what the set of all uncertainty is. You need to specify the distribution over the uncertainty and all that stuff which in many cases is not possible. Uh, but of course, over a period of time, people realize what the risks are, what the distribution is, and then they are able to solve these problems. So of course, nowadays, data science has become important because you can actually collect a lot of data from the past, and you can evaluate these risks very accurately for the future, and then use it to minimize your regret, right? So that's why they want to hire a lot of data scientists these days, because they'll minimize the regret of various firms. Uh, by taking appropriate actions at appropriate time. Okay. Um, doesn't, yeah. Doesn't that build in an assumption that model that the future model is going to be the same as? The yes, it is of course under the same assumption. Yeah, okay. yeah. And then here the optimization problem would be: I want to minimize the expected regret of x comma omega over all x in capital X. OK. Yes? Um, if we're trying to minimize uh, in terms of x, then wouldn't that have y star omega, omega become a constant? And does that affect yes, so it, yes, but, uh, but you can come up with, so when you want to do this sort of minimization, uh, regret minimization is largely used when you don't really know the distribution of omega exactly, but you know it lies in some set, okay? Um, and, and then you come up with some algorithm to compute this minimum, which minimizes the total regret over a long period of time. Okay, so, so 
One of the examples of this uh, framework is multi-arm bandit problem where you want to explore possible actions that you can take. So this is, uh, this is a dynamic, uh, dynamic optimization, so dynamic regret minimization problem where what you do is you explore different values of x, how much, how much benefit you are getting, so how much, uh, how much benefit you are getting, and then you pick, you, you start picking actions or you start picking x that minimizes your expected regret in the long term. Okay, so, so in the static case, of course, you are right in saying that the expected value of regret seems to be the same as the expected value of the function, and you basically this term appears as a constant, but it starts making sense when you have to do it again and again. Okay, and then you can potentially explore uh, decisions that minimizes your expected regret over a long period of time. Okay, so we won't be studying the formulations regarding regret minimization because it will take a lot of time. Uh, but there is, but if you're interested in this formulation, you should look at the literature on multi-armed bandit problems, yes. Yeah, so with the function and we have F where it's, it's the decision and then the uncertainty map to real values. Yes. It was, um, those, those functions, in, when they, they are actually evaluatable as, as opposed to theoretical, well, can we uh, include the idea that a specific de decision uh, changes uh, the uncertainty so oh, they're not completely independent? No, no, no. I, uh, no, that's, uh, you're talking about dynamic optimization because your current actions might affect future uncertainty. But in this particular formulation, your decision cannot affect the uncertainty. Okay. Um, but that's a good formulation. I don't know if people have studied that or not. Maybe people have. I'm sure there are cases where this would appear. Uh, but I, I'm just not aware of where that kind of thing would appear. Okay. Okay. Any question? Yes. Is the optimal parts of all the story problems? No, of course not. They're completely different. Yeah, so in this case, you are picking an action that gives you reasonable cost when, for, for those possible situations where you have a very high cost. Okay, so you pick those actions in this case. In this case, of course, you are risk neutral, so you pick an appropriate action that minimizes the cost averaged over all possible situations. And in this case, you are taking an action that, of course, it, if it was a static formulation, this formulation is the same as this formulation. But if it was a dynamic problem, then in that case, uh, uh, typically this kind of uh, framework is utilized when your distribution on omega is kind of unknown. So, you, so for instance, you could apply this situation, apply this framework in situation where you know that omega is a normal distribution with variance one but you don't know what the mean is. Okay, so the mean could be anywhere between negative five to plus five. Okay, then how do you do the minimization? So you basically minimize the regret and come up with heuristics to figure out what the optimal X is going to be like. So uh, do we have uh, any conceptualization and of how often this needs to be recalculated? Look in the example of this being a financial problem. Is there a way to build in if we're looking 30 years out, how mm -hmm. often and we should reevaluate the data characteristics versus if we're looking at five years out, how granular the recalculation should be? Uh, so if I pick uh, examples from financial, uh, like let's say retirement portfolios, mm -hmm. typically nowadays the companies are doing it and you don't have to do it yourself, mm -hmm. okay? so. So for instance, let, 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 let's say you go to Fidelity and you look at retirement plans. Uh, there is always a plan that says retire at 2050. Okay, that's the mutual fund name, retire at 2050. Which means that it will automatically do this optimization, whatever optimization they're using, let's say this optimization. It will automatically do it at every year or maybe at every month basis. And, uh, and that will make sure that by 2050 you have certain amount of but is there uh, a way to 
you know, build it if, if we're saying thing, we're designing the retirement 2050 fund mm -hmm. uh, based out based on how far we are from 2015 right how often we should recalculate is there any way to well I mean that's all that's all dependent on the decision maker whoever the company is I mean I can't say that oh every five seconds you have to do it or every five years you have to do it it just depends on okay, okay, so this the nature of the doesn't give us yeah. an analytical way no it doesn't okay. no no uh, yeah okay I guess I don't have time so I'll talk about news vendors problem in on Friday's class of course next class is midterm uh, so on Friday's class I'll talk about news vendors problem and then next week I'm going to talk about Markov decision problems okay